rearranged. Duncan Farr had been the man to replace Les McEwen, the lead singer of the Bay City Rollers, when he left in 1979. Duncan's stint with the Rollers lasted for only four years, but with his influence, the Rollers put out three albums of their own material which showed exactly how much talent flowed through that band. Unfortunately, with the stigma attached to the Rollers as being a teeny bop band, their later music was virtually ignored by the radio stations as well as the record company promoters, and the world was never allowed to hear some of the best music that the Rollers had ever produced. Ian and Duncan had to laugh at the ludicrous way they met over a can of beans, especially when they discovered that they had been living only a few blocks apart. It was like a reunion of old buddies, even though they had never met before. Ian had left the Bay City Rollers long before Duncan had joined, and Duncan had missed out on the Breakout 85 tour because of problems in getting a work visa. Apartheid was the headline news in his home country of South Africa, and work visas were far down on the list of priorities. As a result, Duncan was the only roller who wasn't involved in the Breakout 85 tour. While the two men talked, reminiscing with each other on different things that had happened to them during their time with the Rollers, mutual friends they had shared, and the like, the topic inevitably turned to current events. Duncan told him that he was playing at a British pub called the Scotland Yard, then invited Ian to come down and hear him play. Ian took him up on his offer and went down to Scotland Yard the following Saturday to hear Duncan. As Ian talked with the people around him, he wasn't in the least surprised to learn that Duncan often had other famous musicians coming down to the pub to hear him play. Duncan is an amazing guitar player, Ian pronounced. He can do things with a guitar that no one else can. Duncan was playing four sets that night, and during one, he invited Ian up on the stage to jam with him. They launched into Rock and Roll Love Letter, a song both knew quite well from their time with the Bay City Rollers, and were thrilled to discover that their different styles on the guitar complemented each other. It may have been the first time that the two men actually played together, but it would hardly be the last. Not long after that night, Ian was chatting with a woman from San Francisco named Devora. She was a huge fan of 70s music, and they were talking about getting some shows arranged for the band that Ian was in at the time called The Babysitters. Even though Ian had lost heart with his music the year before, it was still very much a part of who he was, as vital to his survival as much as the air he breathed. While they were talking, Ian just happened to mention that he had met Duncan recently. He told Devore about the songs that they did and how good it felt to work with Duncan, even if it was a spur-of-the-moment event. Being a fan of the 70s also meant that Devore was a Bay City Roller fan as well, and she immediately zeroed in on the budding relationship between Ian and Duncan. Ian sounded so positive about the whole experience that she didn't hesitate to suggest that the two of them should play together. Ian liked the idea and gave Duncan a call. The two of them discussed the possibility of playing together, but didn't really get to any specifics. They both simply agreed that it would be nice, and they left it at that. Then, several weeks later, Devore called Ian once again to tell him that she wouldn't have a problem booking shows for him and Duncan if they really wanted to put a tour together. That spurred Ian and Duncan into making some set plans. Joe Stefanelli, who would later play the part of John Lennon in the Mop Tops, was added to the lineup. Then they started to audition drummers. Eric Lannon filled that slot as the fourth member of the group, and the Joy Buzzers were born. Almost immediately, trouble began. Ian and Duncan were having a tough time trying to convince promoters and club owners not to bill them as the Bay City Rollers. It was true that both men were in the group at one time, but neither one had the legal rights to the name, and it wasn't long before a lawsuit was filed against them. When they went to court over the lawsuit, Ian and Duncan brought a copy of a tape with them of an interview that they had just given on a local radio show. The segment was from the Mark and Brian show, and they played it for the judge. On it, they emphatically denied that they were the Bay City Rollers. They even went so far as to tell the listeners not to come to the show if they were going there expecting to see Les, Eric, Woody, Derek, or Alan. It was not a Bay City Roller concert, and none of the other members of the group were going to be there. The judge was even exposed to the problem that Ian and Duncan faced when the DJ stated on the tape, yeah, okay, they are the joy buzzers, but they're also the Bay City Rollers. It was a no-win situation for Ian and Duncan. 
They repeatedly told everyone not to bill them as the Bay City Rollers, but just like the DJs on the tape, they were ignored. The judge understood their plight and decided in their favor, telling the attorneys involved that they were just suing the wrong people. It should not have been Ian and Duncan in the court that day. They had broadcast over the entire Los Angeles area that they were not the Bay City Rollers. It was the club owners and promoters that insisted on using the name. With the lawsuit settled, the rest of the tour was excellent. At Club 1970s on Highland Boulevard in Hollywood, the quartet played to an audience of 2,000 screaming fans with an additional 2,000 people standing outside. It felt like it did back in 76, Ian Beams. It only added to the excitement when the fire marshal showed up to do a head count in the club because it was only supposed to have around 1,500 people and it was well over that limit. Two shows in San Francisco followed, with another in San Jose where MTV showed up to videotape the concert. The entire club was nothing but a sea of people when Ian and Duncan arrived at 6 o'clock to do their sound check with the rest of the band. Even though they were carrying their own equipment with them, the man at the door did not believe that they were with the band and wouldn't let them in at first. Once that was straightened out, they had to make their way through the crowd to get to the dressing rooms which were downstairs. We couldn't even walk, Ian recalls. It was a nightmare trying to get through the crowd. People were sandwiched in anywhere there was a space to stand. With so many people already there, the band wasn't able to do a sound check before the show and had to go on cold. Ian even had to borrow a guitar from a guy in the supporting band because two of the strings on his guitar broke. It was so unorganized, but that's rock and roll. Still, it was fun and we all had a laugh. It was only the start of several shows that maxed out one club after another. The reign of the Joy Buzzers was short-lived, but the group had what it took to make it, and they set California on its ear while they were together. A new addition to Ian's life can be seen in the Joy Buzzers video, Welcome to the 90s, for the person with a sharp eye. Ian had started into the song, The Way I Feel Tonight, at Club 1970s, when his microphone slipped off the stand. A woman in the front row who had handed the microphone back to him was none other than his future wife, Wendy Ann Atonitis, who had been a loyal fan of Ian's while he was with the Bay City Rollers. Wendy, along with her best friend Tammy Lytle, went up to Ian to get a picture taken with him after the show, and that was all it took for Ian. He asked Wendy out while giving Tammy his autograph, but she turned him down. So, seeing that he wasn't getting anywhere with her, Ian actually proposed to her on the spot. Wendy was incredibly flattered. She'd had a crush on Ian since she was a teenager, and had even told her family that she was going to marry him one day. But as fortune would have it, she was already married, and she solemnly told Ian that. Ian jokingly asked her, fancy getting a divorce? There had been trouble brewing for some time in Wendy's marriage, with one problem after another, so she was honestly able to respond to Ian, at the moment, yes, but the rocky road that followed threatened to keep them apart. For the first time, Ian found himself in a situation that he wasn't sure how to handle. From just that one meeting, he couldn't seem to get Wendy off his mind. He had given thousands of autographs, as well as had his photo taken with fans, but for some reason this one particular lady had sparked something within him that had, that had him carrying the image of her face in his mind wherever he went. He even went so far as to question friends about her, to find out any information that he could. He couldn't explain the feelings that he had, but he knew that Wendy would be a part of his life for a long time to come. He was certain of it. A couple of months had passed before Ian saw Wendy again at one of his shows. He still did not understand the surge going through him from just one look in her direction, but he wasn't going to let the opportunity to get to know her escape again, so he went off in search of Joe Stefanelli. A few minutes later, an acquaintance of Wendy's approached Ian on her behalf, and that was all the incentive that he needed to be with her. Ian walked straight up to Wendy, grabbed her hand, and pulled her away from her friends. Who's your favorite artist? he asked jokingly. R.C. Gorman, Wendy returned quickly, then added with a cocky tilt of her head, who's yours? But Ian didn't have an answer because he was not expecting her to have one either. Then Wendy commented on the cross that Ian wore in his ear, and the pair soon discovered that they were not only both Christians, but Catholic as well. The conversation that followed was lost to both of them when they tried to look back on it. They could not even remember what the topics were that they covered. 
but that brief moment of time opened the door to their relationship. For some unknown reason, Wendy felt compelled to tell Ian the story of how her dad had taught her how to ice skate as a child. She wasn't sure at the time why she was telling him about that, because she had never told the story before or since. But, looking back on it now, she feels that since Ian was a part of her life at that moment, she was trying to connect the two. When she was a kid in New Jersey with her father holding her up on the ice, that was her reality, and Ian was simply a pinup on the wall. But now he was the reality for her, and that pond on Crystal Lake Avenue was only a distant dream. As the night drifted on, Wendy knew that the time had come for her to leave. She wasn't comfortable sitting in the apartment anymore because she was a married woman and all too aware of the direction that her newfound relationship with Ian could be heading. Then Ian made a statement that neither of them would ever be able to forget. You're going to be mine, he told her. By hook or by crook, you are going to be mine. Okay, right, she responded with a disbelieving tone. You're going to divorce him, Ian said matter-of-factly. And if I do, you're going to be the first one to know, Wendy promised. Then she walked out the door. When Wendy left, it was the first time that Ian received a taste of what it was like for his fans all over the world. To crave someone that was out of reach was the purest form of torture. Even though he had the memories of their time together to look back on, they were bittersweet. Most people search a lifetime for their soulmate. But to have found her and to have her walk out of his life again seemed like a cruel joke. Finally, one day, Ian received the phone call that he'd been waiting for. Wendy was on the other end and told him that she had left her husband. Just as promised, he was the first person that she called. Then she asked if she could come over. Ian felt a little guilty when he opened the door to see Wendy standing before him in tears. He had been so elated simply from hearing her voice and knowing that she was coming over to see him that he hadn't thought about the pain she was going through. His heart went out to her as he invited her in and asked if she needed to call her parents. When she said yes, he waited patiently for her to speak with them. Then Wendy turned to him once more and wanted to know if they could go out that night. She could not handle just sitting around rehashing the argument with her husband, even with Ian. She simply wanted to get away from her problems to escape from the harsh reality of her life. So the two of them went to hear Duncan play. As chance would have it, Tammy Lytle was there at the club with Phil Fleshman on their first date. So Wendy was able to speak to her best friend about what had happened that night with her husband. Tammy cautioned her not to rush into anything, but she knew that her friend had been having problems with her marriage for some time. Wendy was quite aware of what Tammy was referring to and took her advice, moving in with another friend and only seeing Ian while with a group of people. Ian and Wendy continued to draw closer to each other even though they were chaperoned by several of their friends. Then the day arrived when Ian had to speak up. I need to know if you're going to divorce him or if you're just taking a vacation from him, Ian stated. Wendy answered honestly, I want to divorce him, but I'm scared. I'm Catholic and this was supposed to be forever. I just don't know what to do. She was able to avoid the subject for a time, but the feelings between her and Ian were too strong to be ignored for long, and Ian broached the topic again. I need to know where you stand, Ian told her. I've got to let you know that I'm falling in love with you. During her separation from her husband, Wendy had been speaking with him, trying to find a way to make their marriage work, but her husband wanted everything on his terms. She knew that she was only a cover for him. He simply wanted her there for appearance sake. But she took her vow seriously and she knew that she had to make the effort. So, with sadness in her heart, she had to tell Ian, I can't see you anymore, with the group or alone. I've got to figure out what I'm going to do. I want you to know, Ian stressed, that whatever you decide, I will always be your friend. If you want to stay with him for the rest of your life, I will understand that because you're married but I want to be your friend. The tears began to flow as they promised to keep in touch with each other. They both knew that Wendy had to return to her husband. It was the right thing to do, even though it was also the most painful decision for them to make. Wendy went back to her husband and suggested that they seek professional help with a marriage counselor so that their relationship could have a real chance. But he would not have anything to do with that, and it wasn't long before the fights started again. He would come home in the wee hours of the morning without a word to where he had been. 
Then Wendy began discovering receipts for flowers that were sent to someone other than her, and money started vanishing from their account. But the final straw was a letter that she had found addressed to her husband that crushed all hope of ever having a decent marriage with him. Divorce proceedings were started that following Monday. Wendy contacted her parents who begged her to come home, and then she called her friend Tammy and told her what was going on. In tears and half hysterical, Wendy said, I can't live like this anymore. I'm going to die if I stay here. I can't accept what he's doing. I just can't do this anymore. After taking some time to calm down, Wendy went to find Ian. She met him on his way home from a rehearsal and told him that she was getting a divorce. They rushed into each other's arms and held each other close. Then Ian looked into her eyes and said in all seriousness, I want you to know that I love you but I need to make sure that this decision has nothing to do with me. It doesn't, Wendy responded. This marriage was over a long time ago. You didn't break it up. You weren't even a part of it. Wendy moved in with her parents then to await the final divorce. She spoke with her ex-husband one last time, then she threw caution into the wind and went to Ian. Looking back, both will admit that they were crazy to jump into her, their relationship so soon after Wendy had left her husband, but it had worked out for them. They were comfortable with each other, and it never crossed their minds that they were rushing into anything. Ian and Wendy were working together in a plastering company and were quite successful with it when Ian received a phone call from Les McEwen regarding a legal matter that Les was involved in. They talked for some time, and as usual with old friends, the conversation turned to the past times together and what was happening with each other currently. Les filled him in about the oldies fests that he was doing in Germany then commented that it was a shame Ian wasn't there to join him. That caught Ian's attention. He had been considering going back to the UK for some time just to see what was happening over there, and the prospect of having a bit of work while there made the idea even more enticing. Les cautioned him not to come over just for the shows because they were only doing two or three a week, then added that it would be great to have him along if he did decide to visit. Ian and Wendy flew off to London shortly thereafter and found a one-room flat to stay in while Ian hooked up with Les, who was trying to form a band. The members were changing so often that Les finally decided to forget about putting together a group and started using digital audio tapes or dats for the oldies shows instead, which was quite common at the time. The entire show was on dat, except for Les's voice, Ian's guitar, and the backing vocals. The gigs were coming in thick and fast for Ian and Les all over Europe, the UK, and in Japan. Spots on British television became the norm for them in between shows, and everything was going great. Ian and Wendy's visit to England ended up lasting for two and a half years, and while they were there, they decided to set a date for their wedding. My mother always wanted me to have a December wedding, Wendy reminisced, so we picked December 19, 1992. That gave us plenty of time to get everything together and to have our families fly in. It was the most beautiful day of my life. It was a small wedding with only 40 invitations sent. Ian and his groomsmen, Mark Antonitis, Greg Antonitis, and Lindsay Honey, were dressed in traditional Highland hunting Stuart tartan with short black jackets and bow ties. Wendy's attendants, Susan Vamaka Diet, Tammy Lytle, and Carolyn Chadwick Walton, also dressed in the traditional Highland costumes of red Stuart tartan, silk shirts, and white blouses with a sash across the shoulder. Everything was perfect. It was a Bay City Roller fan's fantasy wedding. Every young girl who ever pictured herself standing at the altar with her favorite roller had dreamed of just the sort of wedding that Ian and Wendy shared. But the brightest jewel of the day was the bride. Wendy was dressed in a white floor-length gown with red roses on the sleeves and at the waist to add just a hint of color. She was crowned in a wreath of red roses and baby's breath with a filmy veil at the back. Wendy was grace and elegance as she led the way down the aisle with her attendants following, as is the custom in Britain. Once the Catholic ceremony was concluded, Ian and Wendy joined their guests at St. Moritz, the same club that Ian had worked as a DJ. Sweetie, the owner, had closed down the nightclub for the evening in honor of the wedding. The night was filled with laughter and tears as everyone lifted their glasses to the happy couple. Wendy's father even sang a love song for them from his ancestral land of Lithuania. Then both Ian and Wendy's parents joined them in a traditional Lithuanian toast of whiskey, salt, and bread. 
To cap off the evening, the bride and groom danced The Way I Feel Tonight by the Bay City Rollers, bringing together the perfect blend of friends, family, and devotion. The round of concerts and interviews started slowing down for Ian and Les, as they usually do in the music business, and Ian's thoughts turned to the States once more. Les wanted to tour the United States as well as Canada, and Ian knew that he could be more of a help to the band if he moved back to Los Angeles. So after talking things over with Les, Ian and Wendy moved back to California, where Ian started actively seeking out promoters to organize tour dates. The tour only consisted of a few dates on the east coast of the United States, then on up into Canada, and when it was concluded, Ian returned to his home in Los Angeles, where he took a job working in telecommunications with a government agency, as well as continuing with his music. That was when Ian decided to put the Ian Mitchell band back together and created a new CD called Rearranged. Around this time, Ian had met up with a guy named Craig Wood. Craig had been a Bay City Roller fan since the 70s, and the two of them spoke on the phone several times before actually meeting. Ian was impressed with the suggestions that Craig had to offer, especially since Craig wasn't in the music business per se, but he was very knowledgeable about the types of venues that Ian should be playing, as well as how to handle the promotion of his new CD. Finally, one day Ian just came out and asked Craig to be his manager. I decided to ask Craig because he wasn't full of bull. He was a nice, honest guy who really had his head together. He was a little naive about the music business at first, but that also meant that he wasn't corrupted by it. Craig was thrilled with the prospect of working with Ian. He booked a few gigs for Ian in San Francisco and San Jose, as well as Los Angeles. Then, when Rearranged was released, through Craig's newfound business, Woodpecker Productions, he lined up several interviews for Ian on television and radio, as well as arranged appearances at record shows to promote the CD. As an added bonus, Ian discovered that Craig was not only a good manager and promoter, but he played the guitar as well. Their time together no longer consisted of simple artist-manager roles, which were the foundation of their relationship. A mutual kinship unfolded that took them into the studio to record several tracks which still have not been released. Craig turned out to be incredible. He's a great guy, and he's also my best friend. As the computer age settled in, an explosion of words like email, chat rooms, and the World Wide Web became common everyday language. Ian and Wendy invested in a computer and became a part of the internet. Up until then, they had been sending messages through their friends, Craig Wood and Tammy Lytle, to a group of Bay City Roller fans who had banded together online to reminisce about the rollers, as well as to keep each other up to date on the latest material available. By now, Ian and Wendy began taking part in the message boards, the chat rooms, the web pages, and the mailing lists. The fans were absolutely delirious to have such open access to one of the rollers, and special chats were arranged so that Ian could join in. And Wendy became so much a part of the group of fans online that new people joining the service were stunned to discover that she was really married to one of their icons. Small groups of the people online were having the opportunity to meet at concerts or shows near them, but many of them still had yet to see any of their online buddies face to face. So Absolute Roller Fest 96 was born. Two Michigan women took on the task of putting together the convention of Bay City Roller fans and picked the ideal location, Bay City, Michigan, the city which the rollers had taken their name from in the 70s. Although it wasn't until Rollerfest 96 that the news was broadcast worldwide of the gatherings of fans to celebrate their devotion to the Bay City Rollers, there were two previous Rollerfests in California held by Craig in his home. The first was only a small gathering, with the second being a bit larger. Then the third, Absolute Rollerfest 96, was attended by people from all over the United States and Canada, as well as fans from other countries as far away as Japan. Becky Mosley and Kathy Rice were the two organizers. Both were long-standing roller fans from the 70s, as well as a part of the online group of people. While they only had a few months to prepare, they put on a fest that is still talked about today. From the moment that everyone arrived Friday night, it was an endless round of love, laughs, and fun. Most of the people there knew each other from their roller chats online, but they had never met face-to-face -face until that fest. It was a strange feeling to have someone walk up to you that you didn't recognize and then fall into each other's arms when you were introduced. It was surprising how well everyone knew each other, but until that moment, 
Very few could put a face with the name. Ian had attended the first two roller fests in California, and he didn't disappoint the fans for the third one either. In fact, he had worked up a duet with his friend and manager Craig Wood and put on an unplugged show for the fans as a climax to the fest. During that hour, anyone witnessing the concert would swear that he was in a room full of teenagers instead of a room full of 30-plus-year-old men and women. Screams and giggles as well as tears followed each song, and the set was followed up with a standing ovation. But it wasn't just the concert that impressed the fans. Showing how much he truly cared for the people that supported him throughout his career, Ian took the time to have a question and answer session, which he followed up with the signing of autographs and taking pictures with everyone. He actually took the time to get to know people, chatting with everyone that approached him and freely distributing hugs and kisses. Absolute Roller Fest 96 certainly won't be the last fan gathering either. Wendy, along with her friends Tammy Lytle, Kathy Grant Page, and Jeannie Cafferty formed an Absolute Roller Fest committee, making certain that everything was legalized. Becky Mosley and Kathy Rice were asked to participate in the committee, but both declined. Together, the Absolute Roller Fest committee will oversee future roller fests, and they are currently planning Absolute Roller Fest 97, which is scheduled for August 23rd in Las Vegas, Nevada. In April of 1997, Ian was given the honor of singing our national anthem in Las Vegas to a large group of people who were being sworn in as American citizens. All of Nevada's congressional delegation was there, including senators, congressmen, immigration officers, federal marshals, and a federal judge, Chief Justice Lloyd George, who was residing over the ceremony. It was a packed house with 1,500 people being naturalized, as well as their friends and families in attendance. Ian was sitting at the head table with all the dignitaries, dressed in black pants and his tartan waistcoat. He was incredibly nervous as he stepped up to the podium to sing the national anthem, but he did a splendid job. After the ceremony, new citizens came up to Ian to ask for autographs, while the press snapped pictures of him with the officials at the ceremony. The Honorable Lloyd George even asked Ian to contact him when he was to be sworn in as an American citizen. His honor was so impressed with Ian that he wanted to request to reside over that ceremony. It was a rare tribute and Ian was overwhelmed by the magnanimous offer. Currently, Ian is working with Craig to set up unplugged shows on the East Coast. The two of them will be playing acoustic guitars and singing a variety of 70s music at different venues. Along with the move from the West Coast to East, Craig changed the name of his production company from Woodpecker Productions to Cosmic Point Productions, as well as bought in a new partner. Nikki Sheck, a staunch supporter of the Bay City Rollers, and Ian in particular, has joined up with Craig to create living room concerts. It's a unique concept fashioned by the duo where the fans can actually have Ian Mitchell in their homes to play his unplugged music. The show started out as a way of filling in the slots between gigs while Ian was on tour, but they had become a craze with the loyal fans. It's the ideal way of not only seeing a man that they had been devoted to for over two decades, but it also gives the fans the opportunity of really getting to know Ian. Recently, Ian was asked to join the National Speakers Association, the NSA. He will be doing corporate shows, not intended for the general public, where he would talk about his overnight rise to superstardom with the Bay City Rollers and how one man's dream had turned into a reality. As if this wasn't enough to keep Ian busy, even more surprises are in the works for the fans to enjoy, including an appearance by Ian along with his former bandmate Pat McGlynn at Absolute Roller Fest 97. And song selections are currently underway for a new CD that Ian hopes to have out soon. I couldn't have done any of this without the support of the fans. It was the fans who made my life possible. Through the good times and the bad, they were always there for me, and I will always be grateful to them. Updates and Acknowledgement Bay City Roller Update Alan is now divorced, and he has a son named Jordan. He still lives in Scotland and reportedly is a partner in a construction company. Alan plays bass guitar with the official Bay City Rollers, but had to take a little time off recently due to illness. He had a mild stroke in the early part of February, but he plans to be back with Eric and Woody on the road as soon as possible. Derek is currently working as a cardiac care nurse at an Edinburgh hospital and takes a couple of trips a year down to his second home in Portugal. 
Derek is still single with no kids. However, he did take a young man into his home several years ago named George, who was originally from Portugal, but now calls Scotland home. Derek doesn't play drums any longer. He's quite satisfied with his new career. Duncan currently resides in his home country of South Africa and recently put out a new CD called For the Rights of All Men with his group, Duncan Farr and the First World Band. You can contact Wayne Coy at AOL.com to order your copy. Duncan is engaged to a lady named Lori who is also in the band. They plan to get married in the latter part of this year. Eric now lives in England and is still single. He's very active in the business side of the official Bay City Rollers, as well as the official fan club. You can reach the lady that runs the club at patsybcr at aol.com for more information on merchandise, CDs, and tapes. Les is married and currently living in England. Pat is still single, but has a longtime steady name, Janine, who you may have caught in the James Bond thriller, Octopussy. Pat and his lovely lady reside in Scotland, and you can reach him through his fan club. He was recently in the States to visit his buddy Ian, but he hasn't toured over here lately. Woody married on March 8, 1997 to an elusive woman named Denise. Very little is known about her except that Woody loves her very much. Woody is still active in the official Bay City Rollers, so we will hopefully be seeing more of him in the upcoming year. Ian and Wendy still reside in California with their pet rats. Mika, Hiromi, and Mayishi. Things in life tend to change quickly, and that is even more true on the WWW. At the time of writing, the web pages addresses were correct, but I'm sure that some of them have changed. Be sure to check out each page for links to other Bay City Roller sites. It's easier to update a web page than to contact everyone who purchased this book when a site address changes. I'll see you around the web. In the back of the book, there were some fan club addresses. Some of the addresses we know are absolutely no longer um, valid. Um, there was Newcastle, Delaware, Essex, um, even Pat McGlynn's home address at the time is listed in the back of the book, and also an address for Duncan somewhere in Alabama. Um, it was also quite nostalgia to see um, a listing of the worldwide websites from back in the infancy of the internet. Um, Bay City Rollers of Dedication, Angela's BCR Forever page, Meet the BCR a GeoCities, <laughs> remember GeoCities website, GERD's Bay City Roller page, which I think is still active somewhere, Mary's Duncan Farr page, iMusic Message Board, and Tufty's BCR page, and of course Peter's Bay City Roller page, which I think may have been the first one. I think he owned BayCityRollers.com at one time until someone probably made him an offer he couldn't refuse. Um, this was really interesting. I didn't know a lot of the stuff about Ian, so it was fun to um, read it for you. I hope you enjoy it, and um, keep on rolling.